Hi y'all, my name is Sean Shriver, and I'm a DynamoDB Solutions Architect. In this 200 level session, we're going to cover some of the features of DynamoDB that developers use to build applications that scale. I've supported DynamoDB customers for eight years and focused exclusively on DynamoDB for the past five years. I've worked with unicorn sized startups, video streaming services, social media companies, enterprises, and game studios in my role. My job is to make customers successful, and that's the background that I took into crafting this presentation. I hope you learn a thing or two about DynamoDB uh, developer-focused features and takeaway information that helps you when you get back into your offices, whether remote or in person. Before we continue, let's check out the agenda. This is a 200-level discussion, and we hope that everyone knows about DynamoDB. That being said, we're going to take a moment to touch on the fundamentals of DynamoDB, including its benefits and features. One reason why we want to do, do this is that we find that our attendees, you all, are, are more likely to engage and ask questions if we give you the 10,000 foot view of the service before dropping down to highlight a couple of features. In this talk, we're gonna cover DynamoDB Global Tables, which offers multi-region, multi-active replication, our pay-per-request billing model called On Demand, and then discuss how a customer is used both to great effect to launch their video streaming service a few years ago. Then we'll cover two different ways to react to row level changes in your DynamoDB table. Perhaps you wanna create a trigger for your table, or you want to maintain a running tally of sold products, or even stream the changes from your DynamoDB table to S3 for long-term retention. These were all possible with DynamoDB Streams or with our new feature, Kinesis Data Streams for DynamoDB. Finally, we will touch on a few important features that we think you need to know in order to get the most out of Dynamo. Let's begin by digging into DynamoDB. First, it is scalable. We have seen single tables hit millions of requests per second. Amazon requests on Prime Day this year peaked at more than 89, 89 million RPS on DynamoDB, and that represents only one customer. If you're not familiar with Prime Day, it's a shopping event lasting a few days and held by Amazon, where deals abound, similar to Black Friday. While most of our tables are small, under 10 gigabytes, we process requests from big customers like Disney, Snapchat, Netflix, Samsung, and many others at the same time we hit that peak. With DynamoDB, there are no pagers, there are no instance qualification tests, and there are no slow query logs. DynamoDB is serverless, and you can use the on-demand mode to pay for every request you send to Dynamo. It is fully integrated with IAM credentials, and your table data is on lockdown with the full support of the IAM policy language. If you want a policy to allow you to write an item on a Sunday morning between the hours of 10 and 10.15 a.m. from a particular IP address, using a specific AWS SDK version, and then you want to revoke the credentials after they are used, you can do that. Not only is the data durably stored in three availability zones in an AWS region, in one click, you can globally replicate your data to another AWS region. DynamoDB Global Tables is a fully managed, multi-region, multi-active database service used by companies such as Disney to bring your watch history and recommendations to a data center near you. First, um, let me say that we will not be covering every feature that DynamoDB has released uh, since its launch in 2012. There has been so much innovation over time that we should focus on just a few of these features. Go ahead and take a look at what the service offers. Is there anything you wish you had but you don't see on this slide? DynamoDB has encryption at rest. It has multi-item asset compliant transactions point-in-time recovery and snapshots, request logging, and stream-based triggers. That is a lot. I have a few favorites, though. Adaptive capacity, if I may so, is one of the most amazing features that DynamoDB has released. We offer sharded, a sharded NoSQL service with limitless scalability in terms of request rates and bytes. On a table, you can go from 1 million requests per second to 10 requests per second in a split second, so long as your account limits are high enough and you have enough provision capacity and or you're using the on-demand pricing mode. Now, you don't need to tell DynamoDB that this is happening in advance, and we bounce capacity across our servers so you don't have to. Adaptive capacity ensures the right servers have capacity to handle your requests, and if we see an imbalance in your access pattern, we may split out your shards to move the heat to its own shard. 
This is very important for multi-tenant use cases. We make sure a high request rate on one key does not negatively affect other keys in your table. Another really cool feature of DynamoDB is the export to three S3 option. In a matter of minutes, we can export a table measured in terabytes or even larger to an S3 bucket in your account. There are zero performance impacts on your production table because we use your point in time recovery logs, which we back up in our own S3 bucket as a source for your export. This allows you to process GDPR requests to delete data by simplifying the search. You simply export the data to S3 and then use Amazon Athena to find the data you're looking for. Then you write a script to permanently delete those keys using the DynamoDB APIs. Finally, but certainly still very cool, as I like to say it, is DynamoDB Global Tables. And this feature is, as I mentioned earlier, a fully managed multi-region, multi-active replication service. It ties together your DynamoDB tables and any commercial AWS region. This means that if you want a global table in every public AWS region and you're willing to pay for it, you can build it with one API call, create table. <clears throat> DynamoDB was launched in 2012, but we didn't release global tables until six years later in 2018. Customers had to do the undifferentiated heavy lifting and build their own replication service for years. Let us put ourselves in their shoes and imagine what you need to do in order to build your own replication service. In order to build a strong replication service in your own AWS account, you need to solve a number of problems that can be complex. You must determine how much capacity is required in AWS Lambda or Amazon EC2, which regions you need to operate in, and what AWS limits you need to increase to meet your demand. You must do all this weeks or months before your go live date. You need to design the monitoring system so that you know if there's a problem. And this means setting up auto scaling, CloudWatch dashboards, and writing documentation and runbooks. With all the free time that you have, you should try to automate recovery in case a server dies. When you're in production, you must consider the ways that you can save money by efficiently using your compute resources. Naturally, you need to size your replication service and scale it as request rates increase or decrease, not to mention deciding how to handle conflict resolution. In this example, we have a one-way replication system set up where region B is read-only. This is based on an ad tech customer of mine who set up servers in the source region to replicate items with the goal of accessing items in the remote region with low latency reads only. In this case, at the end of the day, you're stuck holding the pager. There are customers who are successful who build their own replication systems, and AWS certainly provides development tools and APIs to make that possible. However, I do not recommend this path. DynamoDB Global Table solves all of these problems. You submit one simple limit increase to the DynamoDB service, and we manage the infrastructure for you. We scale to meet your throughput needs, handle conflict resolution, and resolve any operational events on your behalf. DynamoDB Global Tables is available in every AWS commercial region. The service is capable of replicating data inside a global table in about two to three seconds. Try as we might, we are still limited by the speed of light. When you convert a regional table to a global table or create a brand new global table from scratch, there is no fundamental change in how your application calls your DynamoDB APIs. Your applications continue to interact with the regional DynamoDB endpoint. Global Tables works on the back end to replicate your data worldwide under the surface. If I could encapsulate the purpose of Global Tables in one word, I would choose the word anti-entropy. We make an item in region A look the same as the item copy in region B. Now, with Global Tables, you have five nines of availability for your SLA. DynamoDB refunds some of your money if availability is lower than what is stated in our SLA agreement. DynamoDB's actual availability is higher than this number, and I like to say that our SLA exists for competitive reason, reasons as a checkbox feature, not to imply that we do anything other than design for the highest availability possible. I should also mention that inside the region, your data is replicated to three availability zones and is highly available without adding global tables. Now, as I mentioned earlier, DynamoDB is a regional service. This means that you do not have to make any changes to your application to use global tables or replicate data into another region. Further, any region can write an item so long as your IAM policies allow that. This is where complex complexity enters the picture. It is one thing for DynamoDB to provide a replicated table, and it is another thing entirely for your application to write data in a way that avoids conflict. Remember, Global Tables ensures that an item reaches a consistent state worldwide. Let's take a look at one of our customers who's been successful 
with DynamoDB global tables and on-demand capacity. What do you think is the most important information a video streaming service stores in its database? The most important piece of information is where you left off in the latest episode of Loki. Nothing is worse than pausing the show, returning after a break, and not being able to resume the show where you left off. Disney Streaming Services launched on the 12th of November in 2019. Let's focus on one of their workloads called Bookmarks. This is a basic use case for a video streaming service. You start watching a video, pause it, and pick it up later where you left off. Or maybe you're on a plane and you're watching a series and you want to skip to the next episode, or in this case, pick up exactly where you left off. These are handled with the use of bookmarks. Why is it called a bookmark? I, I really don't have an answer for that question. These are, are clearly not books, but that's how we refer to them. As you're watching a video, the app sends a stream of bookmark data to a service in the nearest AWS region. That service writes the bookmark data to a Kinesis data stream. The data is read from a Kinesis stream and ingested into a Dynamo global table that exists in many AWS regions. Clients then request bookmark data from the content API services where they load up and the home page where they load the home page or the series. This architecture allows Disney Plus to serve bookmark data from any region with a bookmark global table. Latencies from when the service receives the bookmark until they have it written in the DynamoDB table are on the order of seconds. Let's double click on the benefits that Disney received from DynamoDB. With global tables, they can add regions over time as their customer base expands. They started with customers in, I think, the Netherlands, and then they expanded to the United States in November of 2019. Now they have markets all around the world. They have been able to add new regions with no operational overhead. Disney Streaming Services is actually my customer, and I remember the flurry of meetings in the weeks leading up to the 12th of November launch. We had to double check their table designs, ensure their capacity and limits were set in the account, and then, of course, test the service and make sure the content content discovery features were working as expected. Now, that last part was not required, but customer obsession is an Amazon leadership principle, and if I can get paid to watch The Mandalorian, I will. One unique thing that Disney Streaming Services did is begin with on-demand capacity and later transition to provision mode. This means that they let DynamoDB scale their tables for them in response to traffic, trading for a higher cost per capacity unit consumed. A common question we're asked is, when should we use the on-demand capacity mode? Now, let me try to answer that question. DynamoDB offers two types of capacity. First, pre-provisioned capacity bought by the hour and units of capacity. Second, on-demand, where you pay per request at the end of the month. If you use the provision capacity model, you take an educated guess about how much capacity you need each hour and pay for it whether you use it or not. DynamoDB auto-scaling modulates your provision capacity in response to consume capacity to give you enough headroom if there's a spike in usage. Provision capacity is good for workloads with predictable usage. Now with on-demand, you don't need to make any upfront decisions about capacity. You will receive a bill at the end of the month for your usage. On-demand capacity is good for development accounts, for SaaS workloads, and spiky traffic patterns. For example, when Disney Plus launched in 2019, about 60% of their tables use on-demand, sending billions of requests to DynamoDB. A common question we receive is, what is a spiky workload? If asked, I would say the following. <clears throat> On-demand is set it and forget it capacity. DynamoDB manages the scaling under the surface for you using DynamoDB's smart scaling algorithms. When I say spiky, I mean workloads where you don't have any inputs or warnings about your demand. Some use cases with these scaling aspects include authentication and authorization services, where you may not know when a mass login will happen. If you're using DynamoDB and paying for capacity but not using it, then consider on-demand. On-demand capacity help Disney Plus to respond to spikes in traffic. For their bookmarks workload, they use AWS Lambda on a Kinesis data stream to receive records containing watch history from their viewers. Now, attaching a Lambda function to a stream is a common development pattern called event-driven programming and is worthy of some discussion. We're going to cover two destinations for DynamoDB's change data and a few considerations to help you decide which to use, DynamoDB streams or Kinesis data streams. They both have the word streams in their name, but their benefits and features diverge quickly. 
Now, as I sat down to plan out what I would discuss on this slide, I first started with creating a list of commonalities between DynamoDB's two streaming options and their differences. After a lot of brainstorming, I found an incredible number of differences between the two options, which we will discuss now. I think that the deviation between the two streaming services, Dynamo Streams and Kinesis Data Streams, makes sense when you consider they are entirely separate services created by different service teams with their own roadmaps. In either solution, DynamoDB acts as the produ producer or publisher of records into the streaming service. All changes for a table appear in the stream for you to process. A change is a create, update, or delete of a DynamoDB item that results in a mutation. If you delete an item that never existed in the first place or update an item and make no changes, a stream record is not created. Reads naturally do not create stream records because there's no mutation. These streaming services can be used for many things. For example, if you wanted to stream changes from one DynamoDB table to another, you could build your own replication service with one of these streaming services and AWS Lambda, writing items as they appear in the stream via the DynamoDB APIs. Here's where they begin to diverge. If you consider record ordering, cost, management burden, SDK versions, and even retention time, you will find many differences between the services. Now, DynamoDB Streams is fully managed, and there is no additional cost to use DynamoDB Streams for most customers. However, Kinesis Data Streams is not managed. You have to create the correct number of shards in the stream to match the throughput of your DynamoDB table. You have to pay Kinesis, on the other hand, for every shard hour and every put into the Kinesis Data Stream. But with DynamoDB, you pay nothing to turn the service on, and there's no cost for shards and you only have to pay a small amount if you read the stream using the KCL SDK. It is free to read a DynamoDB stream from AWS Lambda. An important distinction between the two options is that DynamoDB streams maintains the order of item changes based on the actual position of the record in DynamoDB's replication logs. On the other hand, Kinesis data streams for DynamoDB can lose order due to the design of the Kinesis, Kinesis APIs that we use. We will cover this in a little bit. If you need strict ordering, it is better to use DynamoDB streams. Now, one less important difference. DynamoDB streams retains changes for 24 hours, but Kinesis streams can retain data for a year if you're willing to pay for it. Now, at this point, you may be wondering why customers use Kinesis data streams for DynamoDB. There are many good reasons, primarily the entire ecosystem built around Kinesis data streams. You can connect a Kinesis stream to Kinesis Data Analytics for streaming queries such as aggregations, or to Kinesis Data Firehose for replication into DynamoDB Elasticsearch. That's just the tip of the iceberg. In this slide, we show a Lambda function attached to the Kinesis data stream. When configured, AWS Lambda begins to pull the Kinesis data stream once per second. It reads records that are attached to the stream by the DynamoDB service. Added to the stream, I should say. I do not want to undersell the benefit that AWS Lambda provides. It maintains its cursor in the stream and processes the retries for you. The AWS Lambda service ensures every record is given to a Lambda function at least once. You can attach up to five Lambda functions to a Kinesis data stream, and AWS Lambda stores the cursor for each function separately. This means that the Lambdas can process different parts of the same stream at the same time. The Lambda code in your function can use any of the popular programming languages, or you can create your own runtime. As I mentioned earlier, DynamoDB's implementation with Kinesis data streams does not maintain item ordering. In response, DynamoDB includes an attribute on every record in the stream called approximate creation date time. This is a timestamp accurate to the milliseconds that can be used for item ordering on the client side. It is called approximate, but it is actually created with a tightly controlled clock, and it is designed for this use case. One way you can use this timestamp is to find out which version of the item was written first. You can do this by writing the item to S3 through Kinesis Data Firehose, and then constructing an Amazon Athena query to sort data by creation date time. DynamoDB Streams is a stalwart. Like Kinesis Data Streams, it holds item changes from the DynamoDB table. Unlike Kinesis data streams, it maintains strict ordering of records. Dynamo Streams is enabled with one click in the DynamoDB console and incurs no immediate additional costs on enablement. Every change appears exactly once in the DynamoDB stream. 
Most of my customers configure DynamoDB streams to store old and new versions of the items so they can, can, can compare changes from before and after the mutation. Technically, AWS Lambda pulls DynamoDB streams four times per second, which is four times faster than the Kinesis data streams option. In practice, this means that you can read from your records, read your records from the stream and send them downstream faster. There's one important point of divergence here that I think where I think Kinesis data streams excels. DynamoDB streams does not have enhanced fan out, a KDS feature to add dedicated read throughput at an extra cost. DynamoDB streams read API uses multi-tenant SSDs where we say you can have two stream readers at a time. On the other hand, Kinesis data streams provides a premium feature to let you add many more readers, which is useful for several industries. For example, an online messaging board might have a Kinesis data stream on their DynamoDB chats table, holding one-to-one -one messages between their users. Once a message is persisted, you may want to run sentiment analysis on the chat, send a notification, translate the language, look for threatening language, or maybe copy the message to S3. With enhanced fanout on KDS, you can add many destinations, but DynamoDB limits you to two readers. On the slide, it says at least two Lambda functions can be added because you can have more than two, but at some point you will be rethrottled if you continue to add more Lambdas. I should mention that DynamoDB Streams, by the way, is a completely separate service from DynamoDB. So there is no way your access patterns on the stream service could affect your production DynamoDB table. We're going to touch on a few features offered by DynamoDB in some detail. Honestly, I couldn't figure out where else to put these features in this presentation, so I just threw them on at the end. I think that you need to know about them, though. AWS CloudFormation gives you a way to model your AWS resources and provision them quickly and consistently using templates. CloudFormation templates, written in JSON or YAML, are launched in AWS to create CloudFormation stacks. In programming terms, a CloudFormation template is like a class, and a stack is like an object, uh, an instance of that class. Now, when I began working at AWS over eight years ago, I was actually a CloudFormation support engineer. I used to joke that I was a human JSON linter. And at some point, I created a website inside of AWS for my small team to lint JSON templates. If you don't know what that means, uh, we are essentially ensuring with this website that the JSON document has the correct syntax from the specifications so that there are no validation errors for missing commas or curly braces. Now, at some point, the domain for my JSON Lint website was discovered by other teams. It now receives a few hundred visitors a week, and over the last eight years, it has been referenced by over 500 wikis. <laughs> my manager was quite surprised when he got a ticket about it. Why is a solutions architect running a JSON template validation service for the software development teams inside Amazon? I, I don't know, and at this point, I'm, I'm too afraid to ask. Anyways, back to the important stuff. Confirmation added support for DynamoDB global tables earlier this year with a new resource. While there is no direct path to convert a normal Dynamo confirmation resource to a global table resource, I have a talk on YouTube called What's New with DynamoDB, where I walk through the conversion process and show you a demo where I remove and then import the table back into the stack to convert it. This new global table resource vastly simplifies the management of DynamoDB global tables. In particular, with this one resource, you will create DynamoDB tables in every region you specify, including all the application autoscaling resources that, are, that used to clog your old templates. Application autoscaling, if you're not familiar with it, is a service that makes DynamoDB autoscaling run. Now, I know I keep going off on tangents, but I want to mention one thing. DynamoDB on-demand tables do not use DynamoDB autoscaling. On-demand tables don't have provision capacity, so there is nothing for autoscaling to, well, scale. Only provision tables use DynamoDB autoscaling. Here on the slide, you see the new global table resource for CloudFormation. All the options that you have on a regional table are available with this new resource. However, write capacity on all replicas must be the same. This is a requirement of DynamoDB global tables to ensure writes can be globally replicated with sufficient capacity. If you write an item to one region, we need the same amount of capacity to replicate it to another. Now, let's talk a little bit about NoSQL Workbench. 
NoSQL Workbench for Amazon DynamoDB is a cross-platform client-side application for database development and operations. It is available for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. We offer installers for these operating systems, and when you launch it, it looks like a normal desktop app. Gone are the days where you use Excel spreadsheets to model your table designs. Now, you might be asking yourself, how do I use this tool? Or frankly, when do I use this tool? Designing data for NoSQL databases is a process, but there are many resources to help you build your schema design, such as talks from Rick Houlihan or the Dynamo DB, DB book by Alex Debris. Now, the core steps are first, understand the use case. Second, model the relationships between the entities in a diagram. And I'm talking Visio or draw IO diagrams. Third, create a list of queries based on your access patterns. And fourth, design your schema for DynamoDB. It's this last step where NoSQL Workbench shines. The tool has three different sections that you move forward through as your design progresses. The modeler is where you tell the tool what your primary keys are, how your indexes are defined, and even your provision capacity and auto scaling settings. In the last section, those two will be used to create a DynamoDB table. The second section is the visualizer, which lets you type in your dummy data and see what the table and indexes will look like with that data. What has many more features, I simply think of this section as the data entry portion of the NoSQL Workbench. Now the third section is the operation builder. This is where things get operational. <clears throat> uh, here you can build and test queries in Particle or produce code snippets for a few popular programming languages such as Python and Java. To test queries, the operation builder can use either DynamoDB Local, which is a lightweight API emulator for DynamoDB, or a real DynamoDB table in your account. One really cool feature of this section is the structured operation builder that lets you design queries and then receive code snippets in the results that you can copy into your wikis or documentation pages to speed development. I think that every DynamoDB developer needs NoSQL no Workbench installed. The export to S3 feature is used for a variety of scenarios. Uh, some customers want a copy of their table data stored on premise or in a completely different AWS region. Some customers have daily tables with time series data and want to save on long-term storage costs compared to DynamoDB backups. The export to S3 feature is a lot cheaper than holding onto monthly or on-demand backups. Yet other customers need to find the proverbial needle in the haystack. Perhaps they received a GDPR request to permanently delete a user's data, but don't have a good index to find every place where their data sits. Enter export to S3. This feature has zero table performance impacts because it uses point-in-time recovery data, which is stored in the DynamoDB Services S3 account. You do have to enable the point-in-time recovery feature on your table in order to use the Export to S3 API. When you call the API, you provide the minute from which data will be exported from. DynamoDB will then assemble all of your table backups and condense them into one snapshot for that one minute time period. Then, it exports the data to your S3 bucket. And when I say your S3 bucket, I mean the bucket that you provide. It doesn't have to be in your AWS account, and it could be a bucket in another AWS region. Data is in either DynamoDB JSON or Amazon Ion format, which are discussed in our documentation pages. In these formats, you can use AWS Glue or Amazon Athena to transform the items and send them somewhere else or construct queries on the data to find that needle that I mentioned. I find this feature so impressive. DynamoDB can export a table to your S3 bucket in a matter of minutes on demand with no performance impacts. That is exceedingly hard to do for any database service. Last but not least, remember I said I think you need to know about all of these, is CloudWatch Contributor Insights for DynamoDB. It helps you find hotkeys on your Dynamo table. Now, hot doesn't necessarily mean throttled. It will split out throttles from successful requests. In a multi-tenant table, this feature is invaluable. It will tell you which partition key or which partition and sort key combination are most frequently accessed. In old DynamoDB presentations, we would show you a heat map. And one of the most common questions we received is, how do we get one of those for our tables? Those heat maps had colored bars representing your partitions that would progress from blue to red as key access frequency increased. 
Now, trust me, you don't want those. Only CloudWatch Contributor Insights tells you what the partition key values are. If you want actionable information on which keys are most popular, enable CloudWatch Contributor Insights. You can turn the feature on when you need it, turn it off when you don't. Please be aware, the plain text values of your keys are copied into CCI. So if there's any personally identifying information or other regulated data in your keys, you may not be able to use it due to your company's policies. Now, if you want to reach out to DynamoDB or watch some of our talks, we provided a few links for you. Would you like to get hands-on with DynamoDB? Check out our Getting Started Labs, which are developed in hand with AWS Solutions Architects to get you quickly started with DynamoDB. Do you want to see the latest blogs on DynamoDB? If so, check out our resources page. We've taken the liberty of providing QR codes on the slide. Now, I will call out the semi-official Serverless Land YouTube channel at the center of this list of links. It has serverless content and a playlist of Rick Houlihan's DynamoDB shows as well. If you've ever watched Rick Houlihan Office Hours, also linked to on this slide, and wanted to watch a replay, you can check it out on the Serverless Land YouTube channel. Now, uh, let me share a slide that they gave me. You joined AWS Summit and to, to learn, and you can keep learning beyond the summit with resources from AWS training and certification for databases. Uh, AWS offers more than 15 purpose-built database engines. Let us help you choose the right one for your use case. The database overview course provides a foundation in about five hours, and we offer introduction videos and primers for various AWS database services. For more information, visit aws.training forward slash databases and look for the AWS ramp up guide to create your own learning journey. And we're here at the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for virtually attending my talk today on building with DynamoDB. We're so happy that you took the time to learn about AWS's NoSQL service. If you would like to reach out to me, please find me on Twitter at the handle on the slide. Oh, and, uh, and one more thing, uh, please fill out your survey and let us know what you liked and what we can improve. Thanks again, and I hope you have a great day.